things he does are these. and ministers to us in relation to the truth. Second, he pours out God's love in our hearts. Three, he comes in us with power. Four, he produces the Spirit in us. Currently, we're talking about the second point, that the believers walk in the Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit work and works in us. Now we walk in the Spirit. Under that, we talked about how we place our saving faith in Jesus. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit's conviction, and then we place our saving faith in Him. After we get saved, we respond. We are now walking the journey. What we do is we yield to the present inner workings of the Holy Spirit because He continuously works in you and me. So we yield to His Word. We walk in the truth. He is administering the truth in us. So we walk in the truth. Not just in the things we believe or we think about, but we walk in the truth as in our lives. Because a detachment, a detachment of your, of, of your thoughts or of your belief from our practice becomes a hypocritical walk of Christianity. And we don't want that. We live out what we teach. We live out what we preach and we practice what we preach. So the second thing about that, about this, is resting in God's love. We learn to rest in God's love. I'm not going to elaborate on it further because we did tackle that a little bit extensively. And then the third thing we do is to live in His power. To live in His power. Instead of burning the wick, we burn the oil. And again, encouragement is be very diligent, don't be lazy, but when you come to a point that your diligence causes you to be stressed out, we are doing more than what God wants us to do, or we're doing something different than what God wants us to do. And third, the fourth thing is we bear His fruit. Very important. And the next thing we talked about was focusing on spiritual matters. This is the thing we talked about two weeks ago, uh, prior to last week when we had a visitor, uh, guest speaker, Pastor Charles. So we focus on the spiritual matters, and number six, we put to death our sinful desires and our actions and our deeds. So we continue. Seventh is this. We worship in the Spirit. I want you to say it with me. We worship in the Spirit all together. We worship in the Spirit. Very simple probably, but it means a lot. Okay, John 4, 23 and 24. If it's up there, would you please read it together with me loudly, all together. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The hour cometh, okay, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus was saying, it is no longer, because this is the context of this, is him speaking with a Samaritan woman, if you remember. The Samaritan woman, upon recognizing that Jesus can possibly be, the potential of him being the Messiah, asked him questions, saying, where should we really worship God? Is it in the mount you told us about in Jerusalem, according to the Jewish people, or is it in Mount Gerizim, according to the Samaritans? Where is it really going to be? Is it in that locality or in this locality? That's the reason why Jesus answered this. There will come a time when you don't have to worry about the place. You don't have to worry about the, the forms. I would add to that that. You don't have to worry about the, the geographical location and all these things or the, or the shape, the size, and, and the, the measurements and all those things, the height. You don't have to worry about all those things that I required you when I gave you the law. He said, because now those who will worship Him has to worship Him in spirit. And Jesus said, the time that you will worship God in spirit starts now. And that was during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not rescind that or do away with that or nullify that after the church started. So it continues to our days wherein we are worshiping God. Those who are truly worshiping Him has to go beyond the jargon. I'm not saying it's not good that you come to church, but more than being in the certain place of worship, more than being in such a position of worship, whether you're kneeling down all those things, now it becomes a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with God. Because why? The nature of God is based on the nature of God. He is spirit. God is a spirit. And then He says, not only is He a spirit, if you look at the heart of God on how He wants you and I to worship, His very desire is that you worship Him in spirit. 
It's very clear. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The word we are, the circumcision, is a claim of we are God's people. We are the covenant people of God. And the circumcision is the mark of that covenant, us belonging to God and Him belonging to us. So he's saying we are covenant people, and because we are covenant people, we are the ones who worship God in the Spirit. It's like if you're a person of God, if you're a child of God, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, then it follows that our characteristic, one of the commentaries or one of our um, identifying factors, is that you and I worship God in Spirit. Okay? You and I worship God in the Spirit. Of course, you say here, you rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It is no longer those things. It is no longer even me thinking that, Lord, I will worship you because I am a holy person. It's saying now I will worship you because it's no longer my confidence in the flesh, but because I have confidence in the Jesus who I am rejoicing in. I don't boast about myself. I don't glory about what I can do. I don't rejoice about my accomplishments, although those are good. But more than anything, my boast is in the cross. My boast is in Christ. I glory in Jesus. I glory in His cross. I glory in His sacrifice, His life, and His resurrection. That's what it's saying. Okay, That's what defines my worship now. Okay, It's not this and this. This is what I do. This is what I do. Right? So, and the reason I believe this is very important is because worship, again, if you look at the word worship, it is taken from an old English word that talks about that or he who you place the most worth to. He or that which you place the most worth to. Worth-ship. Worth-ship. Okay? So who do you value the most? The one you value the most is the one you worship. And this is something that I say regarding this. But the reason why it's very important, how many of you have ever been involved in a long distance relationship? Raise your hand. Some of you, right? You've been involved in long distance relationship. I've spoken to people who have been involved in long distance relationship. And majority of the time, and majority of the people I speak to who are involved in long distance relationship really struggle and they have challenges that are really difficult. Okay? They have a hard time. It's not as easy as a normal, um, what do you call this, normal relationship where you are there, the other person is there as well. Why? Because you love the person greatly. But the problem is, although you love him so much, or you love her so much, you are very limited or constricted as to what you could do or how you could express your appreciation for that person because you are constricted by distance. You understand? Okay, this is the reason why the people I speak with, it becomes difficult for them. A lot of you may not agree with that. I'm just saying, generally speaking, majority of the people I speak with. Because there are certain limitations and restrictions. And some of you, how many of you have ever been involved in an arranged marriage? Raise your hand. Okay? Well, some of you are, have been involved in an arranged marriage in, a, in an implicit way. What do you mean by that? It's like, yeah, my dad and mom did not arrange my marriage. But they have put a lot of restrictions. I'm already a college graduate. I'm already this uh, this age. But it's like I'm still very much constricted. They want, they basically have a guy for me. Or they have this woman for me. And they want me to get married to that person. So whatever, and I know of a person like this. I know of a person, very dear to my heart, who who somehow... Like was there was a there was a lady who was like running after him, and this lady was trying to control his life. He was a young man, and the lady was older than him, controlling his life. That every time somebody has a crush on him, she would create scenarios that would destroy the personality or the reputation of that girl, so that this guy would not respond to that person positively. There's a lot of restrictions, a lot of constrictions. And it's not a pleasant kind of experience when you love someone, but you're trapped. You love someone, but you could not express it because you're beaten stop. Right? And God is saying, this is the same with me telling you from now on. 
I want you to worship me without constrictions, without limitations. You can worship me when you're at home. You can worship me when you're at church. You can worship me when you're in the shower. You can worship me when you can worship me when you're on the bed. You can worship me when you're lying down. If you cannot stand up and kneel down, you can worship me when you're standing up. You can worship me when you're kneeling down. You can worship me silently. You can worship me loudly. You can worship me with your hands on your side. You can worship me with your hands up raised. You can worship me with a hymnal. You can worship me with those sprigs and worship songs from Hillsong. Or you can worship me with those sprigs and worship songs from Bethel. Amen. So God is saying, I'm not constricting you. You can worship me on Monday. You can worship me on Sunday. You can worship me on Thursday. You can worship me with this guy. You can worship me with that girl. You can just worship me anytime, anywhere, anyhow. Because God wants you to see the value. Always remember this. Because God wants you to see your real value. When God said... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he follows it up with the second commandment saying, You shall not make unto yourselves any grief, an image, or any likeness of anything in heaven above, or the earth beneath, in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, etc., etc. Okay? Because I am a jealous God, that offends a lot of people. In fact, I'm, I'm not going to name the name of a very prominent uh, network owner who turned her life away from God because of that very preaching or message from the Bible. The pastor was not quoting something new. The pastor was just quoting what God himself said. That he's jealous. He's a jealous God. When that person heard that, God is a jealous God. He said, if God is a jealous God, he doesn't deserve to be worshipped. And he said, do you realize how erroneous the response is and the perception is? When God says I'm a jealous God, He is not being insecure. And the reason why we know this is true is because He, exis he existed in the immeasurable, incalculable eternity past without you and me. And He managed very well. And He lived for eternity in the past. Right? So He's not some kind of insecure person that you have to affirm every time. The reason why he says you shall not have any other gods but worship me alone because somehow the principle I believe in and I see is this. You and I find our worth based on who we worship. There's a reason why when a person puts the most worth or value in a finance or in finances or money or in a person, when that finance comes and they accomplish being a millionaire, whatever the goal is, when they accomplish that, they rejoice, right? They rejoice. When a person has been dreaming about, I want to own a Mercedes Benz. My life's desire is to own a Mercedes Benz. That will give me such a satisfaction. Or when my life's desire is to get married to that one particular woman. And honestly speaking, I could, I, I could name names. I, I probably would run out of names. And run out of examples. When it comes to people that... I, I said, I was deprived of a bicycle when I was a young boy. I don't know why my dad didn't want to buy me that. But I was just deprived. The only time I was able to ride a bicycle was when I would go on vacation with my cousins because they had a bicycle. Okay? That's how I even tried to learn how to ride a bicycle. But I was just there trying to... And from elementary, it came to a point that I had to steal from my brother's piggy bank. So that I could rent bicycles so that I could learn how to ride a bicycle. So finally, lo and behold, I finally graduated high school. And my dad was very pleased with my performance. And then he bought me a racer bike. Yay, right? Yay, racer bike. What a dream. That was mine. It. Right? So it's like, finally, a racer bike. Okay? Red racer bike. So because it's red, I had to buy like stickers and put yellow stickers on it. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, it's an inside thing, right? So put yellow stickers on it, put yellow banner on it, and that was the time of this way back home, all right? So now here we go. Here's my bicycle, my dream. I was elated. The first time I rode that thing, I was elated. And on the first day I rode that, okay, a little dust here and there, wiped it thoroughly. 
Second day, brought it, brought it back in our very small living room, brought it there, watching television, wiping that. Third day, wiping that thing. Even when I didn't go out and bike, I would bike, wipe that thing. Okay? No dust? I would, I would just wipe that thing every day. I was doing that for two weeks. After two weeks, never touched it. <laughs> After one month, Dad said, how come you're not wiping your bicycle anymore? Because that, that, that cloud nine elation was gone. And that's true with everything. You go back, you get back to earth, you step on the ground again, and you realize things are just the same way. Same thing that I spoke, I gave you as an example before. Same thing as a friend of mine who bought a Mercedes Benz, very expensive, right? And I said, how does it feel to own a Mercedes Benz? And I said, two weeks, it's good. After that, it's the same car. It's the same car, you don't even see the luggage problem. <laughs> Honestly speaking, I drew, I can give you examples of examples. What I'm saying is, I got married to this person. Oh man, I've seen people who become very passionate about a woman. I've seen people who become very passionate about this this, this young guy, the hunt, sometimes you get surprised, why? Why is she after that guy? You know? Or why is she after that girl? You would wonder what they see. But I guess, I guess really, God created all of us differently. This is a big proof that you and I are unique and that God created all of us very differently. Because who you find as a handsome guy, your parents, most of the time, would not agree. <laughs> who you find as a beautiful girl, a lot of people will be wondering what happened to your brains and your eyes. Right? But this is because God has created all of us very differently. So you become very passionate. You did everything you can. I and mean, you try to steal her from her boyfriend. And you did everything. Finally, she turned her affection towards you and gave her heart to you. And after you got it, you got married. I've seen many marriages become sour, turn something from very sweet with twinkles in their eyes, within the first few days, they generate into hate and displeasure. Okay? That's the reason why God said, I want you to worship no other God but me. Because when you put the value of anything or anyone else, once you get it, you find that that space is empty. And your life becomes worthless as well. That's the reason why people end their lives, because they found nothingness when they try to grab hold of something they place the most worth to. You will be disappointed. And God said, you place the right word on the right being. Because who really is more worthy than God? Who really is worthier than Him? Nobody else. There's a reason why you gotta worship Him and Him alone. And it's given us no constrictions about it. The one being that really matters most is God. The one part of our, of our personality that matters most is our spirit. And knowing that, then we can conclude that the deepest and the kind of worship that matters most is a worship that is in the spirit. Greatest being was the spirit. The greatest part of us is the Spirit. The greatest connection that could ever happen is to worship God in Spirit and to pray in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. A lot of people will interpret, interpret that very differently. Okay, But however you interpret that, go ahead and practice that. Because there's nothing greater than meeting God's Spirit, the Spirit. What well, is cerebral functions? Cerebral functions more than this emotional facet of our worship is to actually worshiping in our spirit. All right. So the next thing is that I'm trying to finish this. The next thing is this: we depend on Him. Okay, so we worship God in the spirit. The next thing is we depend on Him for our continuing growth towards perfection. We depend on Him for our continuing growth towards perfection. Again, talking about the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, verse 3. If it's up there, would you please read it together with me loudly? Are you so foolish? It's, there you go, it's there. Would you please read it to me? Oh, for with me loudly. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfect by the flesh? The Apostle Paul was here talking again. He says it's so moronic to think that we can grow towards perfection and maturity through our own strength and power. 
That's what he was saying. We got saved through the work of the Holy Spirit. Having begun in the Spirit, we got saved through the work of the Holy Spirit. Meaning, we got to start this journey, or we got to start or begin this spiritual born again pilgrimage through the work of the Spirit. We are going to grow to Christ likeness through to maturity, to perfection, not by our own power, but also by He who began a good work in us, the Holy Spirit. Christ-likeness, which is what we are predestined to become, is the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Not the fruits of our labors. Although we are involved, we cooperate with the Spirit, is the one that bears that fruit. Alright? We partner with that. And I can show you a lot of scriptures that talks about us striving to get that maturity as well. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. There you go. We through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness. This righteousness here is speaking about the practical righteousness. Does everybody say practical righteousness? Practical righteousness. As opposed to what? Positional righteousness. We are, when we receive Jesus, He imputed in us, He placed in us, He put in us His righteousness. That's why we're saved. We're qualified to be in the perfect place with a perfect being because we are completely righteous. Because now we are saved not by our own righteousness, but we are, we are saved through the righteousness of Jesus that is now placed in us. That's positional. We are positioned right there in a the right place because we are righteous in Jesus. But why did Paul say, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness? We're waiting for righteousness. I thought we were already righteous. It's because it's talking about a different kind of righteousness that is a practical. Righteousness, a day-to-day -day righteousness. That's the reason why we see a word over in the Bible. Is that the maturity part of our teaching has to do no longer of the basic teachings of what? Basic taught teachings of repentance and faith, laying on our hands, and in, 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 in what do you call this, the eternal kingdom. It has to do with righteous living. So we hope for that. And the beautiful thing about this is we can have faith, we can believe, we can claim that because of the Spirit of God, God is not going to fail us. And if we're really aiming for that, He will accomplish that in our lives. We will grow in righteousness from glory to glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Pastor, I still have a lot of failures. I still fail. I still fall. But I'm telling you honestly, you should have seen who you were before. <laughs> yeah? Right? If you really have given your life to Jesus, you really got born again, you will see a huge change in your life when it comes to you righteously living. That's our hope, okay? This means, if you look at this, for we through the Spirit, we talk about Him in Galatians 3 and 3, telling you how we are destined towards the image of Christ. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be mature. There's no question about it that God desires and designs and calls all of us to maturity and growth. There's no question about it. No debate about it. God wants us, desires us to grow. What is the opposite of growth? That means to say, if it's a pleasure of God for us to grow, God is not happy when we're stagnant or when we are shrinking back. Instead of growing, we're shrinking. Does the Bible talk about it? Yeah, the Bible actually says, God shall have no pleasure of those or in those who shrink back. Following? Yes. So this opposite, because it's the very opposite of God's expectations to you and to me, which is for us to keep on growing to maturity, little by little, ever increasingly from glory to glory towards our predestination, which is to be, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, towards our predestination, that is for us to be conformed or become or shaped like the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. His very character. Okay? What is that? Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, jealous, goodness, faith, meekness, temper, that, and so much more. Goodness, wisdom, all of those things. God wants us to grow continuously. So it's like when we were born into His kingdom, when we were born into His kingdom, we were babies. Okay, right? We were born again, we, we were babies, and we were drinking milk. What do you mean by that? We were being fed. We were dependent on other Christians. Right? They were feeding us, we were listening, we were hearing the message, we were being fed with like simple gospel, foundational gospel messages. 
then after that, we didn't stay there, amen? We didn't stay there. We didn't keep on like asking FCF to feed us and cater to us and like and baby us, right? We grew up a little bit. And you know when a little kid starts going, Dad, can I help? Right? That's what happened to us. We started serving as well. We matured a little bit. No longer are we being spoon-fed. We learned to feed ourselves. So we started reading the Word of God. We took responsibility. Now we're trying to learn by ourselves. We took the initiative. Yes, we're still being discipled, but now I'm also taking the initiative of learning. Because it's little kids. Yes, they're still being taught, but they're now also now responsibly trying to learn. And then we grew a little bit more, become, become teenagers, 18, 19. In the physical world, what do they become? A lot of militaries go and join when they're 18. When they're draft, the draft age before was what? 18? So now, how many of you see you yourselves and Christians who really mature in the Lord start to fight a battle that's good? Before, they used to like lose in their fight, in their temptations. But now they're stronger in God. When they wake up in the morning, the enemy is alarmed. Because they've learned how to wield the sword of the Word of God. They know how to defeat the enemy. They're fighting battles. They're now trying to help their fellow Christians. Trying to spare them. Trying to fight them these battles because now they're stronger right they're deeper in the word they're wider in their scope now they are like fighting the enemy they've grown and i want you to look at yourself i do this are we this because i've seen a lot of you actually develop into this kind of a warrior in christendom i'm not talking about you being a christian warrior like the crusades and all but in the spiritual sense of the word battling not flesh and blood but against principalities and power you realize how easier it is to defeat flesh and blood than principalities and powers out there but then God told us that we were battling not with the easy enemies. We were battling with the hard enemies. But the beautiful part about this is He has given us the assurance that you are more than conquerors to those that are in Christ Jesus. Because greater is He that is in us. John 4, John 4, 4. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. So we grow and then we become parents. What happens when you become a parent? Now you start taking somebody under your wings and under your belt. And you start teaching them the word. You start discipling them. Now you're trying to guide a little child okay, in their growth in the Lord. So we go through that process. And it's a beautiful process when we do that. It's a natural process in the physical. It's a natural process in the spiritual growth as well in maturity. And the Spirit of God is there to help us along the way. You know what the most heartbreaking experiences I see? When I see these stories in, 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 in journals, magazines, and even television, documentaries and all. And how parents are expecting a baby. And nowadays, you ask them, what do you want it to be? What do you want the baby to be? Girl or boy? What is the answer usually? Anything, as long as they're normal. Right? There's a big thing about normalcy. And I see how parents become heartbroken when a doctor announces to them that there's a problem with the child. And a lot of parents, and especially believing parents, could care less whether this child is quote unquote normal in the world standard or not. They would want to keep the child. But the world out there, you would see the passion they have of trying to convince the parents, you're not going to have an easy life. You're not going to have a comfortable life. Your world will change. And so they, they discourage the parents from bearing the child. They want to terminate this child because this child is not like the other normal children. And a lot of times you see them, especially those who do not have Christ, how heartbroken they are when they see the reality. They may fight, they may be patient, they may want it for, born, it, they may want the baby born, but there's a lot of them who are terminated the pregnancy just because of that normal growth. Now it's understandable, it's understandable when the baby is born that way because they don't have the potential to grow normal. But disappointment, and people don't get disappointed. Parents don't get disappointed because they expected that already. You know what's disappointing? Is when a baby is normal, and time passes by, and they don't mature in their ways and in their thinking. When they have all the potentials in the world to grow, but they're just lazy and they're not taking responsibilities. Amen, parents? Are you following me? Yes. Are you understanding this? It is not normal. It is not something funny when you are 34 years old and you talk like a two-year-old. They may be cute. You may be cute when you were two. Mama, Dada, Baba, 
Mama, Dada, Baba. But when you're 37, and you come to your mom, and you still want her to cook for you, and you go, Mama, Baba. How does it look if a 37-year-old still, still has this bottle, this bottle and sucking that thing? It doesn't look normal at all. Do you want to get married? Ladies, cookie, you want to get married to a person like that? <laughs> right? It's disappointing. And there's something that God sees a lot of times. This is what happens to us. Okay? This is what happens to us. When God says, I want you to grow, and the beautiful part about this is, we are empowered. We have the potential to actually grow because the Spirit of God will not fail you and me. We may feel it's difficult, but it's not because God will be the power behind it. And then this is the last point I have. Number nine. I'm going to finish this, okay? Yeah. Number nine. Everybody say, yeah! yeah. We're on the last sub sub point, okay? Number nine. We avoid anything that will grieve Him. We avoid anything that will grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Very simple and very direct forward and very clear truths about it. It is still possible because Ephesians were being addressed. Ephesians were Christians in Ephesus. And the Paul, Apostle Paul said, grieve not the Holy Spirit. What does it say? We still have the potential and there's still a possibility that a believer can grieve the Holy Spirit. Yes, positionally again, God is always pleased with us. But in a practical sense, in our day-to-day -day life, there's still a possibility that you and I can grieve. Cause a heartbreak. Of the Holy Spirit. He said, don't grieve him. You know why? Because he loved you so much. And is doing everything. He's actually there. He's the one who sealed you. See what he's doing? He's making sure you're sealed. Unto the day of your redemption. He's going to carry you through. He's the one committed. To carry you through your journey. You know, one of the most devastating, probably one if not the, most heartbreaking moments of my life. I'll be very very candid and very transparent during this. One of the most heartbreaking moments of my life is when I cheated on my partner. It was in like seventh year of my pastoring. No, I'm not. I, I wasn't the pastor yet when I did that. I wasn't the pastor yet when I did that. I cheated on her. And when I, when I announced to her and I admitted to her that I had another woman in that basement, during, when I announced that to her and looking at her face, for me, the most beautiful woman in the world. For me. Okay? And I saw her face contort. And cry. And like deep from deep within her, she sighed. Grief. And I... When, and you know what's so funny? Looking at, hands, looking at it hindsight. She may not know this. Looking at it hindsight. And I saw what I did. And I remember the scenario. There are almost every time I remember that. I can't help but shed my tears. And you know why? Because I broke the heart of the one who loved me most. What's so interesting, what's so tragic, was because when I was doing that, when I was explaining that to her, and I saw her react that way, I felt nothing. And the reason why I felt nothing during that time was because my heart has become calloused. And the reason why my heart has become calloused is because I gave in to temptation repeatedly and I got sucked into it. And that temptation blinded me. But despite what I was doing, the pain that I was causing in the life of somebody who treated me like a king in a royalty, I didn't feel it. It was only when I realized, it was only when God awakened me again, I gave my life to Christ, my eyes got clear, took away the scales, that I saw the heartbreak I caused in this beautiful person. And there's something that I'd like to really encourage you, because God, nobody, my wife loves me so much, I don't know, my mom probably loves me more than she does, or she loves me more than my mom, I don't know, but she's one of those two ladies or two people in the world. Nobody would compare to their love. For me. Even if they were equal, me and my mom, of the billion, seven billion people in the world, to be loved 
most by this person. Nobody else loves me more, though. Comparing her love for me, nobody else loves me more than God. Nobody else loves you more than God. And what I did to her is something we do to God every time our hearts become callous because we give into temptation that we know breaks His heart. And that's something I'm telling everybody and encouraging everybody as much as possible. Love Him because He first loved us. The Bible tells us you love Him because He first loved us. That's the natural, supposed to be the most appropriate response, appropriate response of His love, or to His love is for us to love Him, but it's not automatic. Not everybody that God loves, loves Him back. And in fact, according to this letter to Paul, we can actually, there are people who are screaming. The reason why Paul had to write this is because he was addressing the issue. What do you mean by that? The reason why Paul had to say that was a big possibility that there were people who claimed to be believers who was or were grieving the Holy Spirit. That's why you have to say that. Don't. So Heavenly Father, we come before your presence today thanking you for the way you have moved. I want you to speak to all of us. Many of us, Father God, have heard your message over and over and I, I'm thanking you for the way we've allowed your, your word to create transformations in our lives that allows us, Lord, to grow stronger, deeper in our love for you, love for your word. But for those of us, Father God, who may not even have started this journey, may today, may today, there be a day when we will just venture into it, when we will cross that chasm through the power of your spirit, carrying us, dear Father, beneath your wings, to cross that chasm, dear God, of division that separated us because of our sins from you. And to cross that, the cross of Jesus, through the cross of Christ. And start our journey. A journey, dear Father, of growth. A journey of maturity, to maturity. A journey, Father God, of pleasing you, of being pleased by you, loving you because you loved us first. Father, and I pray that you would speak to us today in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. We're gonna